will to figure it out. All we've done is we create rules and religions, laws, that hamper and, and keep us from knowing the fullness of, of the power of who he is. Why is it we can believe for salvation? It happens in an instant, but we can't believe that healing can happen in an instant, but it may not manifest physically. Right there. Question. Right? I mean, do we not believe that salvation happens when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord? We are, we automatically, we have no problem grasping salvation has entered, that eternal life has happened. But if I declare by Jesus Christ, I am healed, if it doesn't manifest physically right then, I have less faith. I'm not really believing. See, we have to get past this thing called our soulish nature and our physical body to truly understand God. Because we've been locked in this, this nature where, where through the fall, our spirit man had died, and so our soul took over. And the only way for the soul to interact in this realm is through the five senses. And I talked about this last week. I'm going to keep going with this today. Because I think we, we, we have to, this has to break through the church. Because the church has been living in the soulish nature for too long. It just we, we create doctrines and philosophies or religions, denominations based on the physical response to a word of God. Do you not realize that we interpret the word of God through our own paradigm? Why do you think that the Israel, the, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, they couldn't grasp him because their own paradigm kept them from seeing the word that was in front of them? We have to change our paradigms. We have to change the way that we really, we've been brought up or we've been conditioned. It goes for our nation too. Look at, we, we've been conditioned. That was, think about the pandemic, it was a conditioning. If you want to feel safe, stay in your homes, close your business, wear a mask, get a shot, whatever. It was a conditioning. We believe the science over God. Hey, I'm not, I take vaccine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that is a whole other issue. But it's truly a conditional where we start to value our physical needs greater than the spiritual need of, of truth of what, who God says he is and what he can do. That was a very good demonstration. I've said this for years. We will give up freedoms to feel safe. We will give up. We will submit to religious law so that we know, oh, if I do X, Y, and Z, these ten commandments, I'm saved. And I, I've got heaven on I'm good. It's easier for us to do that than to truly live by the Spirit of God, which is the promises that He has. So when I'm talking about this maturity, we have to grow beyond this toddler stage of where the church has been left. We, we think salvation and, and, and a belief in Christ is the end result. That's the only reason we're here. It's good people say, no, it's not. The, the purpose is to bring God's kingdom to this realm. That only happens through us. We sit back and say, God, do something. Do you not see what's going on down here? You need to do something. I think Jesus is sitting on the stone and says, yeah, I'm waiting for you to make those images in my footstool. I've done what I'm going to do. When he sat down at the right hand of the Father and said it was finished, guess what? It was. It still is. And he's waiting for his people to bring his kingdom to this realm. Not waiting to try to get out. We have to take off those rapture clothes and get to, to understanding this is it. This is where we're supposed to be. In this realm, operating out of God's will, bringing his love, his presence into this place. And that's how we live. It's, it's a struggle. It's not going to be easy. Jesus says, you're going to have tribulation. Have overcome it. So why do we think the tribulation is going to overcome us? I mean, come on. we got to get... I'm going to talk about time. Because, see, I truly believe...
basically time and this whole end time thing has damaged the church. Yeah. Yeah. Where we really think this escapism is what we're about. We're just going to live as best we can, hold on for all we can until time runs out. Take me out of here. That, that has damaged the church. But I want to talk, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of work through this. This is going to take us some time. Last week I talked about all sons are not the same. Because we're talking about maturity. And the Bible has several different um, aspects of sonship. And I think last, year, last week I also talked about the nature of God. I just want to touch on them briefly and move forward. I made this little, little, little slide that the, the, the Bible designates three different types of sonship. Neophyte, neophotus, means a toddler. That means a baby. I truly believe this is where the church has started. The entrance into the kingdom of God is salvation, and it's like being born again, right? Are we born as a 30-year-old mature adult, or are we born as a baby, needing nurturing and milk? Now, remember, I'm going to come back to this. I call that 30-fold. You are fruit. We're bringing a 30-fold return. Then we have this, this technon. It's like a teenager. They're, they're maturing, but they're still needing the father to do everything for them. We're still dependent upon the father. Maybe we need, maybe we need the Spirit of God to, to move and, and, and see the, the miraculous signs and wonders. Maybe we need to hear the, the tongue spoken, or maybe we need to experience the slaying of the Spirit or the laughter. There's a spiritual aspect, but there is still a dependence upon that. We think that's the result. That is not the result. That's a 60-fold return. Problem is, people in the 60-fold think the 30-fold don't have it right. We laugh at them. They're immature. Right? Oh, look at the little baby. They can't do anything. We think that we know what's going on. 30-fold look at the 60-fold and say, man, they got it so wrong. Their doctrinal stances are so far off. We don't believe in that anymore. What? We have this, this division. Not that there's ever sibling rivalries. I had four kids. They're just... They tend to butt heads. One knows one, one doesn't know one. But the hundredfold is this we also. We always think, oh, we're the mature. We've got a long way to go. A mature son means he's the full authority of God is in him. No longer am I waiting for God to do something. I'm acting on his, beha on his behalf under his authority. He's not saying, James, go do that. That's what a technon does. I direct my child Go do this. Go do the dishes. Go, go shopping for me. Do my laundry. No, I mean, she doesn't do my laundry. I got a lot of my laundry. Um, that's a technon. We're directed. We're with God, show me what to do. God, tell me what to do. Where do I got to go? Where do I got to be? That's, that's a young, you're not mature enough to do it on your own. You know, our purpose of homeschooling our kids was not to get them through the classes, it was to teach them to teach themselves. That's what homeschooling did. When I went to some public school, I had to. I went to school, they mandated, I had to go there, they taught me what I had to do just so I could graduate. Homeschooling is a different aspect. It says, we're going to teach you and let you learn what you like in the, in the curriculum area, and you're going to do it yourself and teach yourself to, teach, you know, to learn. And guess what? All four of our kids are excel. They learned to do it themselves. When I went to college, my first couple of years, I struggled because there was nobody there to tell me what to do. Went off the rail a little bit. But that's it. See, we want to be the, the mature son. We, we're not dependent, dependent upon the Father. We know the Father's will. We have His authority. We will act accordingly. It's a big difference. So why does maturity matter? We reproduce after our own time. What has the church been reproducing? Babies. How functional are babies in a society where all we need is our needs met? That's what we look for. Feed me. People come to church to be fed. Meet my needs, my emotional needs. 
take on my burdens, pray for me. We stay in this realm because we don't learn to do it ourselves, to mature beyond that. So the church has this repetition. We create, it's just not salvation, get saved, wait for a rapture or death. That's good. Really? That's the kingdom of God? Jesus preached the kingdom. He didn't preach salvation. So this, this nature of God, we have to understand, it is a selfless nature. That's who he is. He's selfless. The garden showed us the, the selfishness of Satan. He turned that apple into something that you could have for yourself. You can be just like God. We've been fighting this selfishness for all of our, our existence because without the Spirit of God in us, the soul reigns, which is self. Selfish. What do we understand? Whatever it is about ourselves, what psychology, it's an understanding of our own thoughts, our own mind, all of the psychoanalysts, all of the, anything that deals with our own understanding. How do we live in this world is through our senses. So our senses tell us it tastes good. Okay, I'm going to do that. It looks good. I want that. It feels good. I'm going to... All of those things are what has driven the human dynamic since the, the spirit that was intended to be in, inside of us. When God breathed in, it died. Through sin. Separation from God is death. Until we have the rejuvenating spirit of God put inside of us, the regeneration, it's not, his spirit's not regenerated. It is our spirit that is regenerated. Do you understand that? Because I think sometimes people get, get confused. Oh, is the spirit living in me now? We have our own spirit. He brings it alive. We are a spirit living in, with a spirit with a soul living in a body. We have to get past some of this, understand the selfishness is the nature of Satan. That's why the separation happened, was Adam and Eve wanted what they wanted. God said, don't eat, right? They said, but we want. And we broke that for ourselves. We want to be like you. He told them flat out, you're going to die. Satan lied. No, you trust me, you want to go wrong. Heard that before. That, road, that sign says road closed. What could go wrong? We go right through it. So we have to understand, this, this selfish nature is what we're getting over. That is the soulless realm because it's based on our senses. And so when we think about this, this spirit revelation, see, we have faith from the spirit realm that believes in salvation is an act of faith. I can't touch my salvation. Can you touch your salvation? I can't touch it. I believe it. That's spiritual faith. But since faith is, is based on what we know, it's knowledge, it's sensory, I'll believe it if I can feel it, if I can touch it. Thomas might have been dealing with some sensory faith, right? He's always a, you beat up on Thomas. But you know what? He believed. But Jesus said, blessed are those that believe that do not see. That's us. Thomas had to touch it. He had to see it. He had to, you know, that sensory faith, it's outside in instead of inside out. Religion wants us to change our outside behavior, our senses, what we're sensing, what we want to do to make us clean on the inside, and it can't happen. We see that in the, in the law, the Old Testament law. I'm going to talk about that briefly. But spiritual regeneration is from the inside out. It is because I believe the word of God that says, don't let something filthy come out of your mouth, so I choose not to speak that way. Not, oh, I can't, I can't talk because I don't want something filthy to come out. At the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have to understand this. It is spiritual regeneration. So, so that this sense, knowledge, faith, it's where the churches we, we've stayed. And I know even, even in the, the denominations or even in the charismatic movement, we were still dealing in a sensory faith. If we sense the Spirit of God, we fell out. If we sense the Spirit of God, we laugh, we run around. 
Again, it's a sensory, but we, we believe it if we've seen it or we physically touch it. It's conditional upon meeting our needs. I will believe in God. God, you have to heal me. God, you've got to provide my bank account needs zeros after. It's got lots of zeros. Lots of zeros. Get all the zeros you want. It demands signs and wonders. The, 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 Israelite, the Israel leaders said, what? We demand a sign from you, Jesus. The word of God incarnate is in front of him. He's healing, casting out demons, raising the dead. We want a sign. And then they get offended when he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. I mean, again, your paradigm, our paradigms have to shift. What is the Spirit of God? How do we move in it? I see, religion and doctrine controls the senses. We, we are creating more laws and rules. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't go there. You can't go here. That's the whole issue. That's why we stay. That's what I do to a little toddler, right? Don't touch that. It's hot. Don't go there. You're going to fall down the stairs. Don't do that. Don't do this. We spend more time trying to corral and keep them from hurting themselves because that's what toddlers do. We have to understand that it's outside in, right? We're training them until they can manage it for themselves from the inside out. I don't want to touch that red hot oven because it burns my finger. You let them touch it one time, that sense will tell them, ooh, that's hot, don't want to do that again. But see, that's what we do. We've allowed sin to try to change us on the outside in. We can't do that. And for spirit led, that spirit now becomes our identity is in the spirit of God. Who I am is now dictated by the spirit. We're a spirit man now. Not letting the soul tell me who I am or what I'm supposed to be. Amen. So we have, I, I stopped last week with, with where are we in our sonship status? You know, we, social media, we're always updating our status. Where are we? Because a lot of times we will sit on a Sunday morning and I'm a mature believer. I've been a believer for 50 years. Time does not make you mature in the Spirit of God. In the kingdom of God, it is not about what we consider chronos time. Where have we grown and matured under the authority of God? How often do I need God, will you meet this? Did God do this for me? God do that for me? I don't want to go there, God. I, I can't believe I don't want to. That is still running around in these levels of, of, of neophyte or technon. We have to be the desire to be Christ. As he was, so are we in the earth. That's our, that has to be our mindset. We hear what the Father, we know what the Father wants, and we do it. So that's understanding. Where are we? So I want to go back to the spiritual faith versus the natural faith, because I think that's, this is the paradigm we have to shift out of. So when you think about this, spiritual faith and natural faith. Spiritual faith is truth and love. It's based in truth and love, and it will unite. Sensory faith, natural faith divides. Think about this. What is, our, what is the status of the church today? Denominations split. People will split. I'm going to take my toys, my beliefs, my interpretation, my understanding of this word right here, and you don't want to be a part of it, I'm going to be over here now. Happens all the time. So we take our human understanding, our senses, say, if, if we don't all speak in tongues, you can't be a part of my gathering. If you believe in the baptism of the Spirit, you can't be a part of my gathering. Apostles dead. We don't believe that there's any more of the apostolic. It died with the twelve, and, and we have, so we, we start to divide. And what is that? It is taking this word, putting my understanding on it, and creating division, which is Satan's number one tool. Divide to conquer. The enemy has divided the natural church, but it cannot divide the spiritual church. Do you realize that we can be a part of different gatherings and come together in the unity of the spirit? 
not in the division of a denomination or a non-denominational church, because even that's become whatever. We don't, just because we gather in a place on a Sunday morning doesn't mean I have to, I can only come here, I'm cheating if I go somewhere else. Because that's what, we, that's what we've been trained to do, is because if I'm about building a sheep pen, i got to keep those walls up, and i got to keep the sheep in, because if I'm rated, and my job's dependent upon nickels and noses, as Pastor Bruce used to always say, that sticks with me on to this day. It's not about advancing God's kingdom and letting his realm here and seeing the power of him released. That has nothing to do with it. It's about my sheep pen. About my following online. How many, how many views do I get? How many followers do I have? How many campuses can I have? How many people come to hear me speak? How many people are coming to travel to, to hear this word because he's a prophet? He's, he's this or he's that. We've chased after this. This is what the kingdom is nothing of those things. This is an eye test for you that I. Statistics say that of the world population, 2.5 billion are Christian. The largest number of Christians ever is right now. That's almost 30%, 31 something like that, of, of the total population of 6 point something billion on the planet. Catholic makeup. 53%, Protestant, 36%, and 11% of the Eastern Orthodox. That's Why is this now a chart that divides? Because man says this. I'm going to exclude you because you don't believe this. And then we go to the U.S. 210 million Christians. But yet, look at all these denominations. You've got Pentecostal, non-denomination, Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Reformed, Presbyterian. You got, the list goes on. This is out of, in America, about 49% of the total Christians. So 49% of 210 million Americans are Protestant or Reformed, you know, like the um, non-denomination. 23% Catholic. 7% other, 21% say none at all. Do you realize that is up from 12% in 2003? Why do you think that's up? How united is this church that Jesus said, I am the rock. The gates of hell will not prevail. It's man that's divided. Satan, our enemy, is the one that wants to create the division through theology, doctrine, an understanding of the spirit. My sensory understanding that creates a mindset and a thought pattern that says I can exclude them, I can be a part of that if they meet these aspects of this word. I know I'm going to probably, I'm just stepping on some toes. Nominal churches, think about this. The greatest aspect of a, of, of a lot of the, the mainline denominations, salvation. How many people get saved over and over every week in some of these churches? Their desire is to meet needs. I love that. We, we are called to meet needs, to feed the hungry, clothe the poor, okay? But a lot of the mainline churches, that's their highest level is meeting physical needs. It's true. The charismatic movement. I call it a thrill for the senses. I don't know if any of you guys follow Dutch Sheets with this given 15. I could not have made this up. This was this past week. The given 15 from August 16th. He's talking about the charismatic movement. That the faith that we had in the charismatic movement was in the signs and the wonders, not in the word. That's why we went after the hands, not the heart of God. I think we sung about that today. One of the songs Brian talked about is 
We, we seek his hands. We, gotta, we wanna feel this. We wanna fall out. We wanna laugh. We wanna run. We wanna do all of these things. We don't have the heart of God. And Dutch does a good job of, of, of talking about this from the August 16th, running with the king's heart. And he's talking about when um, after, the, after the rebellion of Absalom, and Absalom was killed, he's sending word back to David about the rebellion, but also about his son. And there's a Cushite that is sent with the word that the rebellion was over, but his son Absalom had died. There's another runner that wants to be a part of this. What's his name? I have my eyes. I don't know. A H I M A Z. My, my Hebrew's not very good. He says, please let me run. I'll take your word. Like, he didn't hear the whole message. He ran because he was gifted to run. He outruns the Cushites with a part of the message. He says, the rebellion's over, but David says, what about my son? When the Cushite got there, he tells him the full story. Guess what? It says that, the, that a high is I, whatever his name is, he goes, you're not going to get the glory for this. It is the Cushite. The nameless Cushite is the one that carried the true heart of the king with him. And so he understands we have run with a gift, not with the heart of God. And this is from Dutch Sheets. It says, why are we running? Because the, 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 a hey is I, or whatever his name, a hey am I, me is, whatever. <laughs> he ran because he could. He was gifted, right? The Cushite was sent with a message for the heart of the king. The Cushite ran because he had a gift. We all have gifts. How we use them can be for ourselves or for God. He says, why are we running? And I'll read this. Why are we running? Building, laboring to revival? Is it for personal fulfillment, fame, glory, self-aggrandizement, to make a name for ourselves? Or are we, as the Cushite in this passage, content to remain nameless? Is it for advancement, a position? Is it to display our gifts, our speed? Or are we looking to build something big? Philippians 3.14, Paul said, I press toward the goal, toward the mark. His goal or mark is called, as he called it, it was clear. In verse 15, it says, I press on in order that I may lay hold of, for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. See, the gift mentality is this. He says, unfortunately, the charismatic movement, as positive as, as I know it was, gave us a gift mentality. We are... We run on the strengths of our gifts. The very word charismatic means grace gifts. And this often led to a performance mentality. Run to set records. Be the first. Be the best. Be the biggest. Build them big and build them fast because the mindset of many in the church, overnight sensations were, in many ways still are, the order of the day. There is nothing biblical about this mindset. Persistent, progressive, hang in there Long-term building should receive more honor than something that springs up quickly. Sadly, it does not. Far more character is needed to build a work or ministry over a long period of time than to enjoy something which happens quickly. One of the basic problems with this philosophy of success, aside from its inherent pride and self-exaltation, is that if any part of our vision, which becomes the goal of running, is born of ambition rather than of God's heart. We are soon running for self, not for the king. Zeal that was originally to do something for God often becomes a zeal to remain successful. This change can be a so subtle it frequently happens without even recognizing it. The church in America is inundated with atomizers, whatever. Yeah. People running for their own ambition rather than for God. The question is not, must not be, how fast or gifted am I? Our speed or giftedness does not validate our running. I'll be quite honest. I have chased signs and wonders, thinking that's what's going to be, that's what I have to, to validate the truth of God. 
I look at, at Bruce and Marlene, they spent 30 years, almost 30 years building something that, that we can build upon. There is no speed in that. There's no speed. I, I've been waiting, God, come on, come on, come on. I've been a pastor for, gosh, I'm like three years, one year, two years, seven years. God, it's not about the time. Who am I? What am I doing in you that allows my spirit to come into this place? And to move according to what I want, not what you want. I've wanted to build things all my life. I think that's why I was in transportation and contra contractor's license. I like to build things. Come on, God, we got to get building here. Let's plan. Let's, let's change you. Let's build you first. Amen. So we have to understand. See, the sense we, 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 we've learned in the, in the charismatic movement, we think if we fall out, we're being spiritual. Why do we have courtesy drops? Everybody knows what a courtesy drop is? They line you up, and they pray for you, and you go down. Otherwise, you get pushed down. Because the holy man in the front needs you to fall to validate him. That is a physical response. The presence of God's word is just a physical response. If we start laughing at it because somebody else is laughing, and if he's laughing, I'm supposed to laugh. If he's falling, I'm supposed to fall. If they're running, I'm supposed to run. If they're waving a flag, I'm supposed to do it. It's the same physical, sensory response to God's presence. It has to stop. It can't. If, if God puts a, a, a powerful laughter on you, let it go. It's good. But if it's done because so-and-so is laughing, I'm supposed to laugh too. It's not good. If God whacks you and you lay out the Spirit and He's ministering to you, do it. I'm not disparaging those aspects of God moving. It's when that becomes the fruit that we're after. It's a problem. It becomes a religion. It, it, it's a doctrine. When we gather together, I'm going to pray for you and I expect you all to fall out. I know there's demonstrations of that in the spirit in, in the scripture. You know, when, when Jesus said, I am, people fell. But you know what? Those were believers. They were believers. When they came to get him and he said, I am, they fell out, they were believers. We should be able to stand up under the power of the Spirit. Yes. If he takes you down, let him minister to you. I get that. But what is he doing? It's not just for you to lay on the floor. It's not just for you to laugh. What is the spirit? What is the word transforming your mind, your will, your emotions into to be able to operate under that? It's not just the act, the sensory act. It is what the spirit of God is doing. Are we agreeing with the word that says, I am no longer bound by this fear. He's letting it go. He's losing it off me. We have to break these things down. And I think this is where a sign of maturity is, where we can say, I don't need to do that anymore. When Paul says, I put away childish things because I'm no longer a child. I don't need that aspect. I don't need to have people fall out if I pray for them. Because that becomes about me. If you do, that's up to you. Not up to me. If I pray for you, you don't get healed, guess what? It's not me. It's not you. We have to understand, we have to break this mentality. It's critical. Because where God is taking us, we cannot be sin conscious. That's where the, the church is saved in a sin conscious state. Yeah. See, the doctrine, religion, doctrine, the law, the Old Testament law, it's about, it, it brings us back under that law if we submit to it. We can, if I submit to doctrine, I'm going back under a law. Might be, might be the, whatever. I'm not going to use denominator. I don't want to. I'm not naming names. But whatever it is, it becomes we're coming back under a law. If that's what we do, if I have to fall out, or if I can't believe, if I can't speak in tongues, I can't do those things to, to be able to fit in over here or to fit over here. I've gone back under the law. It's not God's law. I'm not His original commandment law. But it's man's law, and I've gone back under it. 
That's where the churches stay. It makes us sin conscious because now I don't want to do this. I can't do that. It's about don't say anything. Don't dance. Don't dream. Don't do all those things. We start to, to put all of these mandates because we're on the census side trying to change the internal side. It makes us sin conscious. I can't go to the beach. There's women there with, with bikinis on. I can't talk to a woman by myself because it's a danger. I can't. These are all the religious things that we say about. We have to break them. I'm not saying I'm going to counsel a woman. I'm not. There's also wisdom. But we, we make a rule about this because we want to. I'm, I'm, I can't do this. I don't want to talk to a woman on the phone. I, that's dangerous. I'm sin conscious. Why? If I have a heart for my wife, I don't have to worry about anybody else. I have a heart for God. Guess what? I don't even think that is a temptation. We have to break this, this sin consciousness. It focuses on the senses where sin comes through. The Ten Commandments are a good example. Of the Ten Commandments, how many of them are thou shalt not? Eight, I think, out of the ten. They were dealing with the flesh. You're dealing with the sins of the flesh. The first one, he says, there'll be no other God but me. Love your parents and honor them and you'll have a long life. There's a couple, but most of them you were dealing with coming under the law was trying to control our senses. Adultery, murder, coveting. How do we covet what we see? You gotta correct me. Do I need to do some correction? Okay. <laughs> I figured I, I misspoke with them for a minute. In my Old Testament, they, they, they keep me straight. It's about the physical. So why, that's why when we come under church doctrine and all of these things that we start to, to ascribe to, even as non denominational, we say, well, this is our statement of beliefs, all of these things, and you can do. It's coming under a law, and that's how we pertain, where it's trying to make us sin conscious. That's the danger of religion. In Galatians 2, uh, 3, 2, it says, For answer me this, did the Holy Spirit come to you as a reward for keeping Jewish laws? Do we have the Spirit of God in us because we ascribe to, to what it says, what man says, or what God says? It came to us, but it says, no, you received him as a gift because you believed in the Messiah. Your new life began when the Holy Spirit gave you a new birth. Why then would you so foolishly turn from living in the Spirit by trying to finish by your own works? This is the, do you realize this is 2,000 years ago? And here we are, denominational, every aspect of this, we're going we're to teach you the denomination, how to see God and how to receive God comes through man's understanding. We go back under the law. We're going to work this out ourselves. If it's up to, if it's going to be, it's up to me. Because see, religion and the law, they focus on sin. Dwelling too much on sin makes us sin conscious. An attitude or state of mind wherein we tend to focus on sin's power, magnifying it instead of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Focusing on sin will continue to Continue to amplify our weakness. I gotta tell you, I love AA. I think it's a good program. I have one issue. I'm Joe and I'm an alcoholic. Whoa! Stop telling that to yourself. Stop speaking that over yourself. I got a problem. That's, but we do that, right? I'm James and my back hurts. I've got a thyroid condition. We do the same thing. We speak these things over ourselves. We dwell on the sin. Oh, I, I, I don't want to watch that. I can't watch that movie. There's that, those scenes in there. I can't do that. I don't want to. It's not that I can't. I choose not to. There's a big difference. If I tell my kid... You can drive your car if you have a license. I gave her the car, but she had to have the authority to do it. We have to understand 
We just because we have the ability to reject sin, but sin does not make us clean. It, it, we can't focus on sin to try to be better. It's the, upper, it's the opposite way around. She had to go through, get a license, and have the authority before she could drive on her own. That's how it works. If she wanted to, I mean, there's a lot of people driving around without licenses, but we have to understand this is the, the aspects of if the, a believer that is more conscious in sin than his or her righteous nature tends to dwell in condemnation when they make a mistake. Oh, I can't even do that again. God doesn't love me. I can't. Why, why, am, why am I still doing this? That condemnation is because we're focused on the sin. God can't forgive me. How many times do we hear that? Especially in the newbies. They get saved every week. Oh, I sinned this week. I've got to go to the altar and get, get re-saved. I'm focused on the sin. Not on the righteousness that God has placed inside of me. We are the righteousness of Christ. We can't, we can't change that. We can't earn it. We, we can't lose it. We are his righteousness because he paid the price for that righteousness. It's of Christ, not of anything I do or don't do. Condemnation magnifies sin and tries to make it look like it's greater than the sacrifice of Jesus. Is that not true? Amen. Yep. Whatever the sin is. I'm not, there, I, I don't qualify sin. Lying is the same as an abortion. Murder and theft, they're the same. It does any, you know, coveting, lustfulness, they're all the same. It, I don't qualify them. Homosexuality, it's all the same. Don't, we don't qualify. But the sacrifice of Christ overtook that. But see, when we create doctrine and we have religion, it tells us what's good and what's bad. And so we're focused so much on trying to be good out of our own senses, out of our own understanding. We don't let the Spirit of God overtake us. The righteousness that He's placed inside us, the Spirit inside of us, doesn't come out. It's like it capsulizes, it stays within. In Romans 7, 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. The law is something to judge by. But see, the law exposes for what we are. I didn't know coveting was not right until the Lord said, go covet. I could covet all day long without being against God. But when the law says, no coveting, now, but I want to know. That nature becomes in me. You know, I, I drive down the road and it says, speed limit 55. I want to go faster. And a lot of times I do. And that's sin. I want to go faster. I have a selfish need. And if somebody's in front of me doing 55, God forbid 54, they're idiots. Don't they know I've got some place to be? Even if it's just going home. That's doing because we're focused so much on the law just tells us what is good or bad. We are the ones that dictate it, that when it becomes a part of us, guess what? I don't worry about a speed limit. When I, we were going to New Hampshire for the, the uh, family reunion. We're driving from Boston to New Hampshire. There's traffic like crazy. New England, shocker. It was probably the first time I sat in the right hand lane and just drove. I lived in Jersey. It was it was it was a competition. Driving was it was just it was a competition because I'm just gonna get somewhere before you. That was just I literally drove in that left hand lane, let people you wanna get in front of me? You wanna come in? No problem. It was the most peaceful three hour, which should have been a two hour 
drive <laughs> to New Hampshire. I didn't worry about the speed limit. I didn't. I wasn't focused on breaking because a lot of times, man, you're doing 80. It's like, okay, I'm looking around. Cops are coming. They're gonna get me. You know, my daughter's a cop now. I can't do that. Can't speak in Jacksonville. I wasn't cognitive of the speed limit and breaking the law because I had no desire to. And it was peaceful. It didn't last. I drove like a maniac coming back. But that's, that, that, that's a whole other story. See, in Galatians, it says when your self life craves the things, that offend the Holy Spirit, you hinder him from living free within you. If we're still craving the soulish nature, we're still craving the sensories, guess what? The Spirit can't rule us. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your self-life from dominating you. It's a, it's a push-pull. There is, why do you think this, the battlefield, that, that what is it, what's her name? She says the battlefield of the mind, whatever, joy, 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 Something. Yeah, the battlefield is, 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 is really the soul, spirit, soul, and body. That's the battlefield. Will our spirit win out with the spirit of God, or will the soul and the senses rule the soul? Because that's really where that battle is. So then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the spirit. I don't know that we go to church thinking about this. I don't, I don't remember being taught as a kid, hey, do you realize there is this nature inside of you that you have to overcome and you can only overcome it by the Spirit of God? Not, oh, I gotta try harder. I gotta go to Bible study more. I need to go to Christian school. I can't watch this. I can't do that. I can't go to here. I can't go there. If I could just try harder, I could be a better Christian. If I fell out, if I spoke in tongues more, if I laughed more, if I did... All of those things would be a better Christian. That's the striving. James 1.23 says, For if we listen to the Word, God is Word, the Spirit is Word, Jesus is the Word. If we listen to the Word and don't obey, it is, glancing at, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. If we can't let the word permeate, see, that's how the word works. It is an unseen God. We have to take his word to understand. We can take that word and believe for salvation, but can we believe for the healing? Can we believe for the manifestation of his power in us and lead us in all good things? The goodness of God is coming after us. It's part of who we are. We have to receive it as a word and let it permeate through our spirit into our soul which then drives the body. I can act upon it. If I declare I am healed, guess what? I am healed right now. I may still have a backache. Hear me what I'm saying. My wife, we truly believe that, that God healed her of diabetes over 20 years ago. She's had no experiences of, 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 of eyes and, and kidneys or... or neuropathy, anything. For Since she was three, she's had juvenile diabetes. We believe God healed her. Guess what? It hasn't manifested fully, but she has no complications. She doesn't think about it. She doesn't worry about it because God healed her. That's right. We have to understand this. The body will be in alignment with our spirit. Stop waiting for our bodies to agree with God's word. It doesn't work that way. God will meet all my needs. I have to work harder and try to get some more stuff in there. i got to work 40 hours. He wants me to work on Sunday. It's okay. God, God understands I need to work Sundays. I can work in this industry. I can make something that is not of God. I'm okay with that because God knows I need to make money. Not true. Spirit led. The spirit man submits to the spirit of God. Gaining ascendancy, meaning priority over the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, and running and ruling the entire physical body. The spirit, the word of God, leads the spirit man. It rejuvenates our spirit. That is the one thing that is rejuvenated. Upon receiving Christ is our spirit. My body was not rejuvenated 
when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? I wish it was. It will be. But it's my spirit that was renewed. It was recreated. That spirit man leads the soul in conjunction. Now if I'm led by the spirit, the spirit does not push me or pull me. It says, go in that way. We have to take the step. Jesus says, follow me. That's what the Spirit says. Follow me. Guess what? We can turn the other way. We can allow our spirit man to be led by our soul. Because that soul was led by our... But I don't feel like it. It hurt my feelings to do that. We let our senses override our soul. Let's see, the soul then leads the body and the senses. I am healed. Then my... I'm not listening to my body that says my foot hurts. I'm not listening. I'm not believing my body. I'm believing the Spirit of God. He said I'm healed. By his stripes, I stand on that. Literally, get it? Foot. Come on. <laughs> Romans 12.1. And you've heard this before, but think about this again. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? To surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness experiencing all that delights his heart for this becomes your genuine expression of worship wait for it stop limiting the ideals imitating stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you that is the nature that is the soulish realm that is your senses but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through the total reformation of how you think. We cannot think about our soul, our, our, our bodies being healed if the Spirit has not overtaken our soul. It doesn't work that way. We have to, this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. The Spirit will transform our minds, which will transform our bodies. It's not the body trying not to do something or to do something that's going to change our, our, our soul, which will help our spirit. It's inside and out. Philippians 4, 8, says, tells, it tells us to fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Why do we think about things in this world? My foot hurts. My bank account hurts. My relationship hurts. We think about all of these things. This is, God is in control of these. I will give him control. See, we, we expect him to transform everything like that. When it's about us being transformed. It has to come from us. We transform. We bring the spirit of God into this realm. When we think about the things that are of God, everything else changes. If I come in and I have a need... And I worship, I take my thought off of, off of what my need is. And I put it on him. That thought gets smaller and smaller. Because do you realize what we think about grows? Yes. For good or bad. What we think about grows. Colossians 3, 2 says to think about the things of heaven and not the things of the earth. I love this quote from, from E.W. Kenyon. It says, The part of the man that is recreated is his spirit. The sense-ruled mind is renewed by the Holy Spirit through the Word. So that the renewed mind can have fellowship with the recreated human spirit. Do you realize God's all about fellowship? That's what he is. He's a triune God. has a desire for fellowship. So let's go back to this, this slide here. Thinking about these neophytes and technons. And the weos. It's 30, 60, 100. Think about how do we grow up? Because I love this parable of the, of the sower. We call it the parable of the sower. But I think it's a parable of the soil. Because the seed is the same. When you read this in all four Gospels, it parallels. Jesus, he tells this parable to the crowds. And then he enlightens his disciples as to why he teaches them in parables but also about an understanding of why there is a different return. You can see, think about this from a non-believer through 
of weos, you see the fruit of these seeds in every one of them. It says, what was sown on the path represents the one who listens to the message of the kingdom but doesn't understand it. The adversary then comes and snatches away what was sown into his heart. We see this. We present the gospel and it's, it's on, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't penetrate. It, it, they just believe it. It's usually they're caught up in their own mind. Atheists, whatever, the, 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 the evolutionists, they just say, God doesn't exist, I don't believe it, I don't need it. Or even worse, if I can see it, I'll believe it. We're going to get to that one. The one sown in gravel represents a person who gladly hears the kingdom message, but his experience remains shallow. Shortly after he hears it, troubles and persecutions come because of the kingdom message he received. Then he quickly falls away, for the truth didn't sink deeply into his heart. The seed does not produce. It is because of the root. It does not take any root. Again, the soul still dominates. It doesn't regenerate the spirit. The message has to penetrate. The one sown among the thorns represents the one who receives the message. But all of life's busy distractions, his divided heart and his ambition for wealth result in suffocating the kingdom message and it becomes fruitless. The cares of this world. If we are still stuck in our soulish nature, guess what? How I feel, how I taste, what I see, that dominates me. That dominates my soul. I'm living out of the soul realm. It is fruitless. But what was sown on good, rich soil, that's why I call this the parable of the soil. The seed is the kingdom of God. The sower is God. He, he gives everybody. He says that none should perish. He has given everybody an opportunity to know him. It's the soil that receives the seed that makes the difference. It says, but, but the one that was sold on good, rich soil represents the one who hears and fully embraces the message of the kingdom. Their lives bear good fruit. Some yield a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as was sown. You see, if we understand the spirit realm and the sensory realm, where do we draw our strength from? Is it from the spirit or is it from the dust realm? Is it from the spirit of Satan or the spirit of God? Because that's truly where it changes us. I'm going to close with this. If we are not, if we don't understand that apart from Jesus, we cannot live a regenerated life. Jesus says this about himself in John 1. He says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. His righteousness is already in us. It doesn't get any better. It's the fruit that changes. It's what we do with that righteousness, how we manifest his spirit and his fruit comes out of us. He says, so you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine and you are my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. If a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown in the fire to be burned. But if you live in life in you with me, and if your words live powerfully within me, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are the mature disciples of, who glorify my Father. That is the result. See, it's not... It's not doing certain things. It's not avoiding sin. It's not falling out. That has nothing to do with the regenerated life of a disciple that is mature in the Spirit of God. It has nothing to do with that. 
That is, that is the sensory trying to dictate what, what you look like you're mature. What you think you could be done. Oh, I'm, I, I do so many ministries. I go to so many Bible studies. I'm here. I'm there. I'm, all, I'm doing all of these things. But am I in, is Jesus the one that I'm doing it for and through? Because that's where fruit happens. And I'll leave you with this. Only mature plants bear fruit. You see, immature plants, they don't bear fruit. Babies do not reproduce. Young teenagers should not reproduce. <laughs> Mature, bear fruit. We have to understand if we are led by the Spirit, the Spirit overtakes our soul's nature. We start to bear fruit. And I want to talk about that next week because that is, that's the kingdom of God. Is, he says this kingdom of God is within you. And we release that through his righteousness, peace, and joy. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love. See, without love, nothing else matters. Everything flows from love. I look at those spiritual gifts. Love creates joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Goodness, gentleness. What's the last one? Self-control. Do you realize if we can bear all those fruits, then I can control my physical body to the glory of God. Amen? That's the next. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that next week. Stand with me if you would, please.